Brian Hexel. Before I even welcome you, I want to tell you a little fun fact about John and his wife, Sharon Klein Hexel. Back in 1965, my wife Marilyn and I, just married, moved to South Haven where we took up teaching jobs and Hope Reformed Church. Well, we weren't at Hope Reformed Church, we were invited. Went to the Methodist Church the first week. Somebody at school invited us and we went there. Who was preaching? John Klein Hexel, our very first time in a Reformed Church. We've been there ever since, so John, Thank you for our introduction to the Reformed Church. <laughs> Happy New Year 2023. Can you believe it? It sneaked in while I was sleeping. <laughs> we are so glad you are here today. We are here to praise God. And you can tell by me being up here, usually Steve Martin says, Director of Worship Arts, and tells who he is. I'm Director of Nothing. Um, my wife and I are wonderful members here. Well, we aren't wonderful, but we are members here <laughs> at this wonderful church, and we have been since 1988, and so blessed. So when everybody needs a break, it's left to two people. Our marvelous youth minister, Josh Dupree, who's going to preach today. <laughs> and you will be blessed. I read his text and read his brief summary. Pray for him. He lost his voice. Thursday? Thursday. It's gradually coming back, so you listen really well today. <laughs> We're going to have a Happy New Year's welcoming service today. A look back to a look forward. We are blessed as a congregation. <laughs> I was talking to Becky, and we, we both have a case of the weepies. Well, that's nothing new for me. But her husband, Alan, she's going to sing today, Becky Rusher, right over here. Her husband, Alan, I think you, some of you know that we've been praying for him. He's on hospice care. And the song she's singing today is just a song of gratitude for God's faithfulness. So, besides his voice, pray for Becky's mind and Ryan's emotion. He's more rock than we are. When you fly for Southwest, you've got to have a rock. You know, right now. Sorry, Ryan. Isn't that wonderful? God is tuned in to us today. His spirit's here. I have a verse for you before we even sing together. It's a verse for me for the new year, but it can be a verse for all of us. Colossians 1, 17. He, Christ Jesus, is before all things, and in him everything holds together. Wow! Everything. It doesn't select things. Christ holds everything together. So when things don't look so good, look to God's word in Colossians 1, 17. And remember... Jesus has got you and me, and he holds everything together. In fact, could you read that verse with me? Let's say where it's from first. Colossians 1, 17. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. I was first introduced to that verse, Marilyn and I, when Paul and Lori, our son and daughter, were married by Tim Brown. He chose that verse for them. They have it engraved in their rings, and we haven't forgotten it since. It's so true then, and it's true now. I love Christmas music, and I hate to see it disappear. If you come and ride with me in the car, you're still going to hear Karen Carpenter singing those beautiful Christmas songs, and Richard on the piano. Wow, I just love that album. I'll get rid of it about March. But I do love Christmas music. It usually comes before Halloween. I know that scares you, but that's just how much I love Christmas music. So we're going to sing three Christmas songs in a row, but they don't have to be. They're perfect for today. Oh, come, all ye faithful, joyful. And I, maybe you don't feel joyful today. 
Let this song spur you on to be that way. Would you please stand and sing, Oh, come all ye faithful. Second verse, sing choirs. Sing choirs of angels. Sing in exultation. Oh, sing all ye bright hosts of heaven above. Glory to God. Glory in the highest. Oh, come let us adore Him. Oh, Come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Christ the Lord. Yea, Lord, we greet thee for this happy morning. Jesus, to thee be all glory. Christ is born in Bethlehem. Hark the 
up or down, Dan? Do I want you up or down? <laughs> I want to bring you grace and peace from God <laughs> our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, and I want you to be seated, please. <laughs> You know, not only are Steve and Allison on vacation, uh, but Dave and Tracy are on vacation too. And, and they too uh, have earned this vacation. And, and so I just want to take a moment and remind us how blessed we are to have the staff we have. You know, as you go back and you think about years past, some of the struggles this church has been through, there were times when, when people wondered, you know, is Christ Memorial going to make it? And now there is in this church a spirit of joy, a spirit of optimism, and a spirit of hope. And can I tell you why that is? It's because of you. You know, it was easy in those hard times to go find some other place to worship but some people, the faithful, stayed here and prayed for this church. And, and as we begin this new year, I'm excited to say uh, all of those prayers are being answered in, in the staff that we have, in the vision we have, but in the congregation that sits right here. So I want to invite you. Yeah, you, you can clap for that. Sure. <laughs> So I want to invite you to, to just pray with me, and, and as we do, um, just be mindful of this. God is always faithful. Sometimes we don't see it. And that's why when, when we say the Lord's Prayer, as we're going to sing in a little while, when we say the Apostles' Creed, when we do all the things we do as a church, we do it together to remind each other that even when it feels like God is far away, God is right next to us. He's with us in all things. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are the King of glory. Good morning, Lord. On this New Year's Day, we come and we remember that you are immortal, eternal, everlasting. You have no beginning and no ending. You live outside of time. You don't wear a wristwatch. You don't look at the calendar. But you created days and nights so that we could keep track of time. And now, once again, we find ourselves on the threshold of a new year. As John said, 2023 quietly arrived last night at midnight. And the thought of it, to be honest, is both wonderful and worrisome. We are grateful for the chance to, to leave some of the things from last year in the rearview mirror. But we're also a little apprehensive about what waits for us in the coming months. And so this year, Lord, our, our resolution as a church is to try and be more intentional about prayer. To wake up praying, to live the day praying, and go to bed at night praying that you will work in us, through us, and with us to help share the gospel of Jesus Christ with our community and with our world. In Jesus' day, people wisely began their prayers for the new day and for the new year by acknowledging who you are, Lord. They said these words, Baruchata, Adonai, Eloheinu, Malecha, Ha'olam. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe. Literally, blessed are you, O Lord, our God, king of everything on both sides of the horizon, king of the things that we can see and king of the things that we can't see.
king of the things that we can understand and king of the things that are beyond our ability to understand. It is a great prayer. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, king of the universe. And because you know all things, we can trust that not only do you know everything we're going through today, but you know everything we'll go through in the coming year. And so knowing that with the prophet Jeremiah, we can say, there is one thing I know and it fills my heart with hope. God's love never fails. His mercies are new every morning. And so this morning, Lord, all we can say is thank you, Lord. Thank you. Amen. With your eyes wide open, congregation, let's continue to pray, singing the Lord's Prayer. Our What's important to remember when we look back, as the song says, that all the things that have happened in your life before have prepared you for what lies ahead. Isn't that awesome? There's not a single thing, there's not a single frustrating moment in your life that God hasn't used to bring you to this point. That's amazing. That's amazing. So, as we Step forward into a new year. He's with us and will continue to be with us. So we can do this with confidence and not with fear. In my moments of fear, through every pain. Here we go, tear fest. It's okay. Every time John and I get together, we cry happily together. Um, it's just the most remarkable thing. However, I'm just going to speak the words. He's been faithful to me. When I've had no strength, he's been there. When it's been hard to sing, and there have been times when I have lost the ability to praise, he's been there. Every time when we think of his grace and his great love, 
It's always, always there. When you're feeling alone, when you're feeling that nobody can possibly understand, he's faithful. Some of you are facing a lot more difficult things than I am. He's there. In every moment, he's not going to let you go. And unknown to you, there are people who are praying, people who are supporting you, people who are bringing you laughter, people who will cry with you, and people who will just sit lovingly. Those are all God's gifts to us. What a wonderful, loving God we serve. And for those of us who are hurting, what a wonderful opportunity for us to share God's faithfulness for those who don't know because we are his hands and feet. They need to see us survive and thrive through struggle, through hardship, through loss, because we are his hands and feet to so many. And people are watching us, how we react, how we process. And in the end, we can just give God the glory because that will continue through our families, through our friends, through our communities. And it's so neat when I think of my father's faith and the joy that he had. And all of a sudden, I'm my father's child, both my earthly father and my heavenly father, the strangers will say to me, why are you so happy? Let's make 2023 a year, not of Christians who just go through life, but go through life with a greater purpose and with a greater strength, because we have the power of the God of the universe within us and to share with others. So he has been faithful. Trust him encourage others and we can do this together as a family he's been Josh now, as he opens the word of life to us, touch his voice and his heart. Thank you for Becky Rusher. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for those words. I don't think there's a better way to start the new year. But thank you for reminding us of God's faithfulness in all things. Thank you. Um, good morning. Uh, I hope you're all having a wonderful start to your new year. Um, I know Steve isn't here, but I was definitely calling him all week because I was like, dude, I lost my voice. 
this morning. I need some, some tips on how to get it back. And so thankfully, he gave me this whole regimen that I have to follow. It's awful. All the things on it taste terrible. Um, <laughs> So choir members, if you ever lose your voice, don't ask Steve for tips. But, uh, but I think I've got it back a little bit enough this morning, so we're going to try to fight through it. Dan, if I can't make it through, I have everything written out, so you've got to come up and close for me. Um, but I am so excited to be here with you this morning and celebrating God's presence and be reminded that he is always faithful, that he is in all things and he is always with us. I don't think there's a better place to start the new year than in the presence of the Holy Spirit and with the people of God's church. Now, I'm especially excited this morning because as a pastor's kid, I would often sit in the pews on Sunday morning waiting to be embarrassed by my mom's illustrations about my brother and I. Now, the tables have kind of turned this morning. My mom is actually here with us this morning, and I'm the one that gets to be up front. So luckily, I'm preaching after Christmas. Thank you for all the presents for Charlie. Mom and Dad, we're super grateful. I love you very much. Um, and please remember, this is a story that I'm telling from like when I was 10 years old, so I'm sure the details are a little exaggerated. But my, uh, my family used to live in Hanover, New Hampshire, and one of the things we used to love doing growing up was going hiking in the White Mountains. And I remember one day we were hiking on this trail that had all these little caves and kind of these tight passages for kids to crawl through and walk around. There was kind of the main path for the grown up, but then off to the side, like all these really, really cool things. And we came around a bend one morning and there was this, this super big cave. I mean, to me at 10 years old, it looked super big. If I went back there today, it's probably like 20 feet long. Um, and it had this sign out in front that said, you must be this small to enter the cave. Like it was only for children. And so being the good uh, boys, me and my little brother were, we went and asked my mom and dad if we could go in. And they said, of course. And, and so we start going into this cave and it is absolutely amazing. There's all these really tight passages you got to go through. It, it's super cool. It's kind of dark and cold. It's a really, really fun place to hang out for a young boy. And, and so we're about 70% of the way through the cave. And all of a sudden we hear my mom say, that looks so much fun. I'm coming in. And me and my brother, we look at ourselves and we're like, no. And so we kind of try to turn around and get back. But remember, it's like kind of tight passageways. We're like, mom, you're not going to fit. You're not going to fit. And as we're making it way back, all of a sudden, you just hear the shrieks of my mom in fear. She's like, Timothy Scott Dupree, Joshua Ryan, Jeremy Tucker, you got to get me out of here now. I'm stuck. Now, those shrieks and cries were quickly drowned out by the laughs of me and my little brother and my dad. And I learned an important lesson from my dad that morning. I remember what he said. He said, Kirsty, you may have the heart of a child, but that doesn't mean you're the size of one. And I learned in that moment that even if you didn't do anything wrong, even if it's not your fault, if you don't watch your words, you can still get in a whole lot of trouble. I think there's a verse in Proverbs about that. You can ask Chelsea if I actually learned that lesson or not. Now, I don't know exactly, I don't remember exactly how she got out uh, of the mountain. I mean, obviously she's here this morning, so she didn't get stuck in there for forever. I don't know if rangers had to come or, or what, but I do know that she was stuck in there long enough that I was called the kid whose mom got stuck in a mountain for the next two years at school. The elementary kids are mean. <laughs> but uh, I don't know, I think that's a story we can all kind of relate to. Maybe we've never been actually stuck in the side of a mountain before, but maybe we've been stuck at some point or trapped at some point in our lives, not necessarily physically, but emotionally, kind of trapped in our own thoughts, our own mistakes, not wondering, like, what's next? Is this mistake always going to define me? Maybe we've gotten too far into a situation. We've taken all these steps and we finally got to this place where we realized this is not the path that God outlined for my life. And we have no idea how to kind of walk back. Or maybe our future is staring right in front of us. And it's uncertain. It's unknown. And we don't know how to take that next step into it. It's scary. And we're stuck. And we're trapped. You see, the number one asked question on Google this year was how can I change? How can I become 
unstuck? How can I transform? This feeling is prevalent. But my question is, why are people turning to Google to know what the next step to take is or how they can be set free from what is holding them? Corden, I'm sorry we might lose our Google Suite account for this, but guys, as a culture, why do we turn to Google? Why do we look for things in the patterns of this world? Why do we look for the answers in culture when we have the gift of God's word in our very hands? Because the Bible is all about a rescue operation to free us from whatever is holding us captive. It's all about how the king of the universe came down from heaven to enter into our story, to bring us transformation, to bring us change, to bring us redemption, to bring us hope, love, peace, and joy that surpasses all understanding. And we're looking for the answers on the internet. Friends, we shouldn't be looking up, how can I change? Rather, we need to be praying, God, do a change in me. Transform my heart. God, show me what next step to take. God, where can you be faithful in this situation that I don't understand? God, get me through this. Because, friends, whenever I've felt stuck, I've tried to look for the answers in all the things of this world. I've looked for it in drugs. I've looked for it in alcohol. I've looked for it in relationships, in my job. And the only place that I've been able to find true healing and true freedom is in the arms of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in the powerful prayers of God's church praying for me in the moments that I've been stuck and had no idea how I was going to get out of it. You see, Romans 12, 2 says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. So often when we're stuck, we search for the patterns of this world. But friends, when we're stuck, we need to pour into God's word. This needs to be our focus. This needs to be what our center is on. We need to remember the words that God says about us, that we are known, we are loved, we are washed clean. And then we'll be able to walk out of whatever is holding us into the freedom of God's perfect will for our lives. And yeah, we're just getting started. So I want to look at a story here in the greatest story of all time that I think may relate to all of our lives in this question of how can I change? How can I become unstuck? So let's dig into God's word this morning. And if you will, if you'll please open your Bibles with me to Acts 12, uh, verses one through 18. Yeah, if you've heard me preach before, you know I like to go through really, really long passages. So you guys gotta buckle in. I promise we won't read it all at once. I know it's New Year's Eve morning and Dave said I gotta try to keep at least 10 of you awake through the whole service. Uh, So we'll break it down. But as you are turning to that passage, I also want you to stick your thumb into Luke 22, the story of Jesus' arrest, crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension. Because I think there's a lot of parallels going on between that story and the one we're going to look at this morning that God is trying to speak through. So Acts 12, verses 1 through 5. It was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. And when he saw this was met with approval among the people, he proceeded to seize Peter also. This happened during the festival of unleavened bread. Now, this is our first parallel to Luke 22. Jesus was arrested at the time of Passover or the the festival of unleavened bread. And people studying the Bible back in the ancient world, they paid a lot of attention to when things happened. So immediately they would have started to connect these two stories. Now, after arresting him, he put him in prison, handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. Now, before we get started, we kind of have to understand the context of this story. It was not an easy time to be part of the early church. In Acts 11, it talks about how they are experiencing a severe famine. They are facing heavy persecution. They literally not only had to trust in God's faithfulness for their everyday needs, but also in his faithfulness for their very protection. 
Yet in the middle of so much opposition, the church is beginning to grow and expand. And I think sometimes, guys, in the midst of our biggest obstacles, in the midst of our biggest trials, in the midst where it doesn't seem like God is working at all, that's when our faith can actually grow the most because we don't focus on the patterns of this world, but we have to fully trust on the faithfulness and the presence of God. But the fact that the church is growing upsets certain leaders. So to try to regain some political power, Herod has the intention to persecute the leaders of the early church. Now the church has just witnessed James be beheaded. And now Peter, the rock the church is supposed to be built upon, is sitting in prison. And it looks like everything that they have been building up to is about to come crashing down. And this isn't just a normal prison situation. It says Peter was guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. And if you know anything about Roman military terms, the number four is often associated to their top teams, their special forces units, their army rangers or Navy SEALs or whatever you want to call it. He is in the most secure form of containment possible. And the church knows what just happened to James. And they know that it's most likely going to happen with Peter. And if that's met with approval, it's most likely going to happen to them as well. And so in this moment, they know only a miracle will be able to set Peter free. And so the church is earnestly praying for Peter. But friends, I don't know if I would have had the faith to keep praying for Peter after witnessing and experiencing James beheading. I think I would have been a little devastated, right? We prayed for James and God didn't do anything. Nothing happened. Why would anything happen for Peter? I think the early church had something fundamental figured out about prayer. Yes, we pray big and bold and specific prayers, but they weren't praying simply for results. Rather, they were praying for the presence and the faithfulness of God to be with them in every single moment. That even if they didn't understand what they were going through, even if they didn't understand the obstacle, even if it didn't play out how they wanted, they put their trust in God and said, God, we need you to walk through us with the, in, this, in this moment. And so they are earnestly praying. And earnestly praying doesn't mean it was one of those nice, quiet, whispered prayers. It means they wouldn't stop. It means that even though they hurt, they prayed. Even though they were disappointed, they prayed. And even though they had, they had no clue if it was working, if Peter, Peter may have already been dead. There's not news sources back then. Peter already could have been dead, but they still prayed. And it's the same Greek word, another parallel here, actenos that describes the prayer when Jesus knelt in the garden of Gethsemane and said, not my will, Father, but your will be done. Friends, that's a hard prayer to pray. Surrendering that even if I may not understand the obstacle, God, I trust in your faithfulness, that you are in all things. And so God, walk with me through it. This earnest type of prayer puts the burdens, the things that we can't understand, the confusion that we have onto the shoulders of the one who can. And sometimes in our biggest challenges, there's also this beautiful opportunity to draw into the presence of God, the one who is faithful and working all things together for God's good. This summer, our high school students will be serving at Give Kids the World Village in Orlando. Florida, and I'm so excited. This place is a magical place. I got to go there a few years ago, and they're going to have the opportunity to walk alongside and serve families that stay at the village for their make-a-wish experience as their child is facing a terminal or life-threatening illness. It seems like it'd be such a dire and sad place, a place of so much opposition, but it is one of the most joyful and happy places I've ever been. And while I was there, I, I met a kid named Malcolm, and he came, became my buddy for the week. Like, we did everything together that week. And at the end of the week, I was talking to his mother about prayer. And, and now as a parent, this conversation still sticks with me, and I'm even more blown away and inspired by the faith of this woman. You see, she told me that Malcolm had been given a diagnosis They gave him about 18 to 24 months to live. It was terminal. But every day, she didn't simply focus on her circumstances. 
She said, we're going to make every single day the best day we can. We're going to find joy in all of the moments. We're going to see God's blessing every day. And so they prayed bold prayers asking for a miracle and healing. But they also simply asked God for strength and comfort, to bring their family closer, to have wonderful memories, to have a very fun day. They prayed for God's presence. And she said, every single day. Even in the darkest moments, God always showed up. And so somehow in this unfathomable circumstance, their faith continued to grow stronger. And she shared something with me that's always stuck with me. She said that if I only focused on what I was going through, if I only focused on how my child might pass away in two years, I wouldn't be able to believe in a good God at all. But that would be tragic because the only way that we can face and get through what we are going through in this moment is because of the overwhelming love and presence of God every single day in our life. That prayer doesn't always change the obstacles in our way, but it changes who we walk through them with. She was never grateful or thankful for the obstacle, but she was so thankful for God's faithfulness and God's love and the prayers of her church and the people that had surrounded her family in the midst of that situation. And friends, that's the type of prayer and the type of faith that I desire to have one day. I don't think I'd be in that place right now if Charlie was in that same situation. But I desire to be there one day. I desire to be in a place where peace is not necessarily just the absence of conflict or obstacles, but it's the abundance of God's presence that we continue to hold on to the truth that he is working all things together for God's good. And even when we cannot see it, even when we cannot understand it, Jesus is always there. Now I want to check back in what's going on with Peter. So if you'll come back to verse six with me. The night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers. Sleep? Man, when I first read this, I thought the translators got it wrong. But it said, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains and sentries stood guard at the entrance. How is Peter sleeping in this moment? I don't think being chained by two guards is probably a very comfortable position, and he's most likely gonna die tomorrow. This is the greatest trial in his life. How is he sleeping? I can barely sleep when my wife starfishes the bed and comes onto my side. It wakes me up every single night. But even when I'm in my comfort be- comfortable bed under my blankets and my awesome pillows, there are so many thoughts running through my head that keep me up at night. My to-do list for the day. Or I don't know if any of else of you do this, you run through your day and you look at all the stupid mistakes you made and you're like, oh, I could have done that better, I could have done that better, or I should have done that. I replay my day and it, it keeps me up at night. I could barely sleep before I had to give a sermon this morning because y'all are scary. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. It's because I so often find my identity in my accomplishments, and in what I do. I'm only as good as the last sermon I preached. I'm only as good as the last illustration I made. I'm only as good as the last cool youth group game I came up with, and there are some pretty cool games we come up with. But I'm only as good as the last cool thing I did for Charlie. I'm only as good as the last romantic thing I did for my wife. And my identity and my value is all tied up in what I do. Anybody else feel that? Like we're only as good as the type of parents we are, or the type of spouse, or, or, or what we do at our job. And we lay awake at night. Or even worse, we focus on all the mistakes we've made. And we think, how can God love us anymore? And we feel stuck. Because we've gotten this cycle of it's all about what we can do. And so we Google, how can I change. When friends, walking with Christ is never about our performance. It's never about what we do. It's all about Jesus's performance for us and what he did when he went to the cross for each and every single one of us, that our identity is found in him, not in our accomplishments. And we are loved unconditionally for who we are. 
See, what keeps you up at night? What voice is the loudest in your head? You see, Peter can sleep in the midst of the greatest trial because the loudest voice in his head isn't the one of the enemy who shouts lies from heaven, from down below. But it's the voice of Jesus who is telling him truths from up above. That he is loved, he is a valued, and he's a child of the one true king. And so he can find rest in the midst of his greatest trial. But you see, Peter wasn't always like that. You see, when Jesus was earnestly praying in the garden of Gethsemane, what was Peter doing? Peter was sleeping. And now, when the church is earnestly praying while Peter's in prison, Peter's still sleeping. I want what that guy's got. But however, the reason for Peter's rest and each circumstance are very different. I love Peter because of the growth that we get to see in him. You see, when Peter was first walking with Jesus, he was walking in baby shoes in a onesie like a toddler. But now in this moment, he has journeyed along his path with Jesus. He's walked with him faithfully every step of the way. He's been covered in the dust of his rabbi, and he's walking fully in the footsteps of Jesus. He has graduated from his baby shoes into the person God always knew he could be. You see, Peter's transformation through pursuing Jesus in his life serves as a model for all of us. There's probably nobody in the Bible who has his mistakes more documented than Peter. The guy gets called Satan when he thinks his plan is better for Jesus than God. He argues about his spot in the kingdom. He tries walking on water and he like sinks in or falls off because of his doubt, right? He sleeps in the garden. He chops a dude's ear off. Even though Jesus has always been preaching nonviolence, people come in, boom, that's his first reaction. I don't know. And then he denies Jesus three times. He runs back to his old life. You see, but the good news for Peter and for each and every single one of us is that Jesus doesn't require perfection. Peter's story is the epitome of grace. Jesus didn't see Peter for his mistakes. He was seeing who he was growing into and he calls him the rock the church will be built upon. When he gives Peter that nickname, Peter isn't there yet, but Jesus sees who he's becoming. Because every time Peter made a mistake, he didn't hide in his shame, he turned to Jesus for correction. You see, Jesus isn't pursuing people that have it all together. He pursues people who are willing to walk alongside him, to admit they're not good enough on their own, and who desire to be molded into the people he is calling us to be. And so now Peter can sleep in confidence in the arms of his Lord and Savior. And friends, I'm not there yet. Just like that woman at Give Kids the World, just like the early church, I'm not there yet. I'm still trying to walk with Jesus every single day, but I'm probably about like my daughter Charlie in a toddler size seven. I think many of us, especially me, when we make mistakes, we allow our shame to isolate us. We feel stuck and we don't know how to move past it. We feel trapped by it. We allow it to define us. But Jesus didn't come to earth. He didn't go to the cross. He didn't, he didn't come down to be born in a manger, which we just celebrated last week, so that when we make mistakes or feel shame, we would run and hide but he pursued us unconditionally so that we would know without a doubt we could run to him and we could grow and learn because grace pursues where shame and the enemy want to isolate us and separate us from community and make us feel like we are our worst mistake. But Christmas shows us just how far Jesus traveled to meet us, to pursue us and invite us to walk alongside him. That grace is the reality that Jesus loves us for who we are, but he loves us too much to allow us to keep walking in our baby shoes and desires us to grow under the rocks that his church can be built upon. Jesus is not pursuing our perfection. He's pursuing our hearts and our presence. And as we grow, as we step, as we, we graduate into our bigger shoes, we need to go out these doors and pursue other people and invite them in in the same way that Jesus pursues us so that our community, our friends, our family that are out there can continue to learn and walk fully in the footsteps of Jesus because that is what the church is calling to bring all people to Jesus and to walk alongside him as disciples of Christ. Now Peter's about to say he's set free but he's only gonna play a real small part in it. Because friends, I think when we surrender, when we rest, 
And we say, I'm not trying to do it all on my own anymore. Jesus can do far more in our lives when we're sleeping and resting in him, when we're trying to do it by ourselves. And Peter's about to come to face to face with that reality. So we're gonna get back into the scriptures. Verse seven, my Bible's ripping, my hands are sweating. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Quick, get up, he said, and the chains fell off Peter's wrist. Now something interesting is going on in that first verse right there. The normal progression we would expect is for the chains to fall off and then we walk into freedom. However, the angel does it in a different order. He tells Peter to get up and Peter doesn't really even know what's happening. This could be the first step to his execution. The Peter in the past would have had so many questions in this moment. But here, he is putting his full trust in God. And for Peter, the freedom comes after the trust. It comes after he's willing to take the first step. And I think that's an important line for us to grasp because as people, we love having all the details, all the directions. We want God to tell us every single step. How many of us have prayed the prayer, hey God, you do this and then I'll do that. God, just free me from this and then I'll walk into that. And I'm not shaming us for praying that prayer because the first step into the unknown is very uncomfortable. You see, even if we don't like the places we're stuck, many of us have become comfortable in them. They've become our normal, they're what we know. And so we just kind of like to stay. But I believe that faith is stepping into the unknown when we don't necessarily know how everything will play out. But we are trusting in God's faithfulness and the promise that he will work all things together, even when we don't understand it or see it. Peter takes that step forward because he's letting Jesus' faithfulness in his past guide his steps into his future. Is there anywhere that God is telling you to get up? Is there, is there anything that God is calling you to do, but maybe you're too scared because you don't have all the details? It might be a little different than what you'd envision. Maybe it'll put you on a new path. Maybe you're scared you'll fail at it. Friends, sometimes our biggest failures are the greatest lessons we learn. I encourage you to be like Peter, to trust our faithful God and get up, and you might learn something on the journey. Peter takes the first step to seek freedom, but then God intervenes. And there's another important thing for us to grasp, that God will carry us in the moments that we're not strong enough, in the places that we can't walk ourselves, but he won't take the steps for, that we can ourselves. That sometimes we need to get up so that we can experience the full power, grace, and freedom that Jesus brings. So where are you called to get up? Because when Peter gets up, something miraculous happens. Verses eight through 11. And the angel said to him, put on your clothes and sandals, and Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me, the angel told him. And Peter followed him out of prison, but he had no idea what the angel was do doing was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. They passed the first and second guards and came to the iron gate leading into the city, and it opened for them by itself. Kind of like the doors of Meyer, right? You just walk up and they open. Here's another parallel. The stone was rolled away. The gate was open because guys, our God is a way maker. When there is a barrier in our life, God doesn't necessarily remove the obstacle, but he makes it in a way for us to walk through it with him. Man, if I could sing, I'd start belting out Michael W. Smith, but then you'd all plug your ears. And I think the spirit has more to say to us this morning. He walks into freedom. And it says the angel walked him one length of the street and the angel left him. Peter walks out of the most secure form of containment into the freedom of the night. And I love it because there's no indication that Peter did anything other than taking the first step. It was all what God did for him. I think that's sometimes how God likes to work. God loves to use us in the areas that we're not strong enough because then we can truly experience the depth of his love, his power, and how he carries us through all things. Those that know me well know that it is only through the power of God that I can come up those steps and preach in the morning because preaching to all of you is my biggest fear in the entire world. 
but yet it's in this experience that I dread. Guys, you all need to pray for Chelsea because the week's leading up to preach and I'm a mess at home. But it's in this experience that I dread, that I know that I could not do on my own, that I experience the presence and power of God. Now, I do have to take the steps. I have to get up and say yes when Dave asks me. I have to research. I have to write. I have to prepare. But I also have to trust that God will carry me and get me through until 1030. Well, maybe a little longer this morning. <laughs> Sorry. I get animated and fired up when we're talking about the Bible. But I love verse 11. Read it with me. Then Peter came to himself. And said, now I know without a doubt that the Lord has sent an angel and rescued me from Herod clutches and from everything the people were hoping would happen. Is that something you can relate to? That in the darkest moments of your life, you really had no idea how you were making it through. Maybe you didn't even recognize God was there until after the fact. And while you were in it, it all felt so confusing and so uncertain and you hated every minute of it. But now that you're through it, when you look back, you can see Jesus was always there. And that trial and that obstacle has formed you and made you the person you are today. God will carry us in the places we can't carry ourselves, but he won't carry us in the steps that we can take. You see, the angel takes Peter one street over and then leaves him. Now, why is that important? You see, the way that this city is made up is the main street where all the houses that are located, that are big enough to host a group of people praying for you, are located one street over from prison, the prison. And so the angel takes Peter exactly to where he knows he is. The angel carries him in all the places that Peter can. He gets him out of the prison. He gets him through the guards. He opens the gate. But then when Peter knows where he is and he can take the next step, the angel says, now it's your turn. And friends, sometimes it's hard to see the next step or where God wants you to go. But friend, God desires to set you free from whatever is holding you. God wants to meet you in the middle in any area you're stuck. The doubt, the financial hardship, the trauma, the worry, the grief, the addiction. Whatever is holding you onto, whatever is weighing you down. There is no pit, there is no darkness, there is no sin, there is no mistake that God will not enter in and bring healing, redemption, love, and freedom. That even though the enemy may have intended for darkness, God's purpose will always prevail. So may we stop Googling, how can I change, and start praying, God, how can you make a change in me? God, show me what step to take. God, give me the courage to get up. God, carry me in the places I can't. And God, give me the strength to take the steps that I can. Because we're not called to stay stuck. We're called to be a people that walk in the freedom and the grace and the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ every single day. So if you've been worried about what next step to take or how things will turn out, take a deep breath. Remember all the times that God has shown up in the past. And know that he's going to show up in your future as well. Because God's job is the outcome. And ours is to trust the process. You see, God made a way for Peter when there was no way. And I believe he'll do it again. See, Peter, when he's set free, right, this is not where the story ends. He's still got to go to some people. And when he's set free, when he's in trouble, he goes to the church. And friends, when we're in trouble, it's really important for us to know the right place to go, the right people to go to. And so Peter goes and finds the people that are earnestly praying for him. Because he knows that following God is not an individualistic relationship, but it's one that's all about community. So verses 12 through 16, we're almost done. When this had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. And Peter knocked at the outer entrance, and a servant named Rhoda came to answer the door. And when she recognized Peter's voice, she was overjoyed. Here's another really funny line. She ran back without opening it. She slammed the door in his face. Peter's at the door. You're out of your mind, they told her. And when she kept insisting it was so, they said it must be his angel. But Peter kept on knocking, and when they opened the door and saw him, They were astonished. Man, I love the Bible. It's so funny sometimes. Colleen Hoover has nothing on Luke. Only the youth will get that joke. But Peter gets there, and he doesn't want to be out in the open. People are looking for him. 
And yet this young girl, Rhoda, slams the door on his face and goes and tells everyone, and they don't believe it act- it's actually Peter. I can't imagine the thoughts going through Peter's head in this moment. Like, I just got this miraculous escape from prison, and now the very people that were praying for me are going to get me caught again because they won't let me inside. And here's another parallel. Mary Magdalene's the first one to notice Jesus. She goes and tells the disciples, and they think he's a ghost as well. Rhoda, notice Peter's. She goes and tells the people that are praying, and they think he's a ghost. They've been praying for something so strongly. And yet when the answer is standing at their door, they can't even believe it. Did God actually do that? Did God actually make a way? And I don't know about you, but I can relate to their surprise. I think a lot of us pray for things or hope for things or or secretly wish for things that we don't really even believe could ever happen. Right? It was easier for them to believe that Peter had died and an angel came to the door than to actually believe that he'd been freed from prison. Sometimes it's easier for us to believe that we're worthless. It's easier for us to believe that that mistake will keep us stuck for, forever than it is to read the words of God and be reminded that the water of the Red Seas were parted. The stone was rolled away. The gate is open and God has made a way for you to be brought back to life in him. Sometimes it's easier to believe you will never be set free than to believe God did do that. Now, many of us remember the show Family Matters. And Steve Urkel's famous line, did I do that? Now, I'm not as good at impressions as Dan, and I don't think I can pull off suspenders, so I'm sorry I didn't dress up this morning. But he would say it after he made a big mistake to try and redirect some of the blame, even though it was always pretty evident it was his fault. And I know God doesn't make any mistakes, but I think sometimes we miss the powerful ways that God works in our lives, and we're left asking the question, did God do that? When Peter went to see them, they slammed the door in his face. I think this happens to many of us. We pray, but do we pause to see how God has answered? Or do we recognize that God may have answered our prayer, but in a different way than we were expecting? So friends, as as we step into 2023, I want to look back at 2022 and notice all the ways that God has been working in our lives, how he's answered prayers. And then I think we can have the strength and courage to face the current challenges we're in. And so friends, I just want to take a moment to notice some of the ways that God has answered big prayers at CMC this year. And this is just a short list there. God has answered so many more prayers. And friends, I want to be a church that shares the way God answers prayers because I believe when we share the ways God shows up, there will be a revival that happens in our community. But 130 volunteers and students were sent on mission. That doesn't make mistakes. That doesn't, that doesn't make sense in the patterns of this world. But God did that. This community fully funded a Thanksgiving offering. In one week, you raised over $100,000 to benefit three ministries and disaster relief. That doesn't make sense according to the patterns of this world. But God did that. We're starting a, a new food pantry and pe- uh, people helping people in Pullman. Rock the Block did over 200 backpacks. A couple of our students, after they got back from Jamaica, wanted to do something for the villagers that we met there. And so Roger Hernandez put on a clothing drive and his goal was 200 pounds of clothes and they collected over, five, over 700 pounds of clothes to be sent to Jamaica. Just this week, I heard a story of a, a daughter and a sister who has been estranged from her family for 13 years. Yet in that time, the family kept praying. And just this year, reconciliation has started to happen. Carrie Hompkins, a member of our staff, was diagnosed with an aggressive form of breast cancer. And I want to share something that she wrote for us. You see, as soon as my cancer journey began, I felt surrounded by the goodness and kindness of God's people. God showed himself to me through his people who reached out to me and generously prayed and tangibly supported me. Additionally, I've experienced an unexplainable peace that passes understanding through the whole journey. And I know that peace could only come from Jesus. I've had very few side effects from five months of chemo, surgery, radiation, and six months of oral chemo. It's really unheard of. But a direct answer to so many prayers. Did God do that? Yeah, God absolutely did. Now, I believe that God sometimes answers prayers in supernatural ways. 
like the angel that walked Peter out of prison. But I also believe that some of the most powerful ways that God answers prayer is through the prayerful people of God's church. God loves to use us to answer the very prayers that we pray. God showed up through all of you in 2022, and I believe that he will continue to do it again as well. So over the next few weeks, we're going to be entering into a sermon series on prayer. And Stephen McCarthy has put together some amazing resources and opportunities for us to be prayer partners together. So if you're feeling stuck right now, I encourage you to find someone to pray with. Maybe it's a pastor. Maybe it's myself. Maybe it's another staff member. Maybe it's the person sitting next to you. That's a great way to meet someone new in the new year. But together, let's bring our challenges to God and let, let his voice be the loudest so that we may find rest in the midst of our greatest trials because of who we are and whose we are. And here's the very last verse. I promise this is the end. Peter motioned with his hand for them to be quiet and described how the Lord had brought him out of prison. Tell James and the other brothers and sisters about this, he said. And then he left for another place. You see, in the very first verse of this story, it says Herod's intentions were to persecute the church. But you see at the end of the story, Peter's walking free. Herod's dead. We didn't get there. I don't think you guys wanted to go through another 12 verses. But Herod is dead, and the church is beginning to thrive. Herod's intentions didn't play out too well. Because what the enemy may intend for evil, our God will always use it for good. You see, right after Acts 12 and Peter being freed, he goes and tells everyone about what God did. And there's this extremely powerful shift in God's church. James's role in the church begins to take off. And in the next chapter, Acts 13, right after this, Paul and Barnabas are commissioned to begin their missionary journey to the Gentiles. And the church explodes. And I believe that they can take these intense, scary, challenging next steps because they are recognizing that God's faithfulness in their past is going to inform their future. The same way that God met Peter in prison, God's going to meet them in this next journey. Now, why all these parallels? There's seven of them that I found. There's a slide uh, that we went through. Well, I believe there's all these parallels with Jesus' story because I think that the Spirit is trying to tell us that the same resurrection spirit that raised Jesus from the grave, the same resurrection spirit that freed Peter from prison is the same spirit that lives inside each and every single one of us and we can be resurrected, we can be set free from whatever is holding on to us. That we are a new creation in him, that we can trust in God's faithfulness, that we are a resurrected people. And we, we may walk into the future knowing God is with us, every step of the way. Brad Gray has a beautiful quote that I want to end with. As followers of Christ, we walk backwards into the future with confidence, noticing all the ways God has met us in our past. May this be how as a church we walk into 2023. May we notice God's presence every day. May we be reminded of all the ways that he has answered prayers. May we be reminded that we are outfitted by the resurrected spirit that dwells inside of each and every single one of us and commissioned to enter into the world and be an influence as ambassadors of Christ. We are a new creation. We are no longer stuck. God has set us free. God has done it and God will do it again. So as we look back, we see, we see all the ways that Jesus was always there. Let's pray. Dear God, I thank you for your church. I thank you for every single person here. God, I thank you for carrying us in the places that we cannot, but empowering us and gifting us to take the steps that we can. God, I pray that every single person here we know that they are loved, they are valued, and they are known by you. God, I pray that in the same way that you parted the Red Seas, in the same way that you rolled away the stone, in the same way that you set Peter free from prison, 
that if anybody is feeling stuck this morning, may you enter their lives. May you help them get up and may they walk into the freedom of the grace and love of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And may we notice that Jesus, you are always with us. Amen. When the life I built came crashing to the ground When the friends I had were nowhere to be found I couldn't see it then, but I can see it now There was Jesus In the waiting, in the searching in the healing and the hurting Like a blessing buried in the broken pieces Every minute, every moment Where I've been and where I'm going Even when I didn't know it I couldn't see it There was Jesus For this man who needs amazing kind of grace For forgiveness at a price I couldn't pay I'm not perfect so I thank God every day That there was Jesus In the waiting, in the searching in the healing and the hurting Like a blessing buried in the broken pieces Every minute, every moment Where I've been and where I'm going Even when I didn't know it I couldn't see it There was Jesus on the mountain In the valley In the shadows of the hours In the fire and the flood Always is and always was No, I never walk alone You were always there Beautifully done. Nice, Ryan. Um, I think this young man needs a round of applause, too, before we go. Yeah, you, you can see why when I say I'm excited about the staff, why I'm excited about the staff. 
Great job, Josh. Josh and I often talk about sermons as I'm preparing them. I write it, it's way longer when I write it than when I deliver it. Um, and so I give it to Josh and I say, what should I cut? How can I change this? What should I do? And, and so I'm gonna take just a little piece of that, Josh, and say, Maybe there's some influence there that I've helped you a little bit, but I know your mom. And I know your mom has been a great influence on your life and your preaching. And, and I look forward to hearing him preach more and more as we go into the future. So with that, I'm gonna let you go. Would you stand to receive the benediction? May God seeking comfort find you. May his loving arms bind you. May his might protect you and his wisdom direct you. And may the joyous love of Jesus Christ be with you and those you love this year. Amen.